Bonjour tout le monde. Uh, good morning. Thank you very much for coming today. As you know, I'm normally accompanied by Senior Deputy Governor Wilkins at these press conferences. She is currently working from home as she recovers from back surgery. Carolyn will be back in the office very soon and back here when we return in April. So let me begin, as usual, with a few remarks around the issues that were most important to the Governing Council's deliberations. At the global level, <clears throat> 2015 was a little disappointing, as the world dealt with diverging economic prospects and shifting terms of trade. But we expect a gradual strengthening to resume in 2016. There's been considerable attention paid to recent developments in China, and this has added to volatility in global financial and commodity markets. However, it was Governing Council's judgment that China will remain on its transition to a more balanced and sustainable growth path from around 7% annual growth to around 6%. Volatility in equity markets is, of course, not always a reflection of weak economic fundamentals. Nevertheless, the global equity market correction may inject a further measure of caution into business decision making. Our global outlook remains positive albeit cautiously so. Le Conseil de Direction est d'avis que l'économie américaine reste solide. Le quatrième trimestre de 2015 a été faible, mais nous croyons que cette situation est largement temporaire pour les raisons évoquées dans le RPM. La croissance de l'économie américaine devrait remonter à près de 2,5 cette année à la faveur de facteurs fondamentaux robustes, notamment des gains importants réalisés au chapitre de l'emploi, un niveau élevé de la confiance des consommateurs et des investissements considérables à l'extérieur du secteur d'énergie. Not coincidentally, the Canadian economy appears to have stalled in the fourth quarter. There were some temporary factors at work for us, too. But the main issue was slower exports to the U.S. We expect growth to pick up to 1% in the first quarter, along with the U.S., and then to move back above 2% for the remainder of this year. Our new annual growth forecast for 2016 is 1.4%. However, much of the downward revision in that figure is because of the weakness that we saw in the final quarter of last year. On a fourth quarter over fourth quarter basis, growth for 2016 is projected to be a more solid 1.9%. In its deliberations, Governing Council focused mainly on the implications of lower prices for oil and other commodities for Canada, and of course for monetary policy. This shock is complex because it sets in motion several forces. Canada earns less income from the rest of the world. Our resource sector begins to shrink. The Canadian dollar depreciates. And the non-resource sector expands. Now that's a lot of structural change. We are publishing a discussion paper today that offers additional analysis of this process. One implication is that it may take up to three years for the full economic impact to be felt, and even longer for all of the structural adjustments to take place. Depuis la publication de notre dernier RPM en octobre, ce choc a nettement pris de l'ampleur. Les entreprises continuent à réduire leurs dépenses d'investissement, mais nous avions déjà incorporé la majeure partie de la baisse dans nos projections d'octobre. Le changement plus important apporté à ces projections découle de l'incidence de la baisse encore plus marquée des prix du pétrole sur les revenus. Canada. As one measure of this change, our base case forecast suggests that it will now take longer to absorb the economy's excess capacity, probably until late 2017, and perhaps later. This is a significant setback compared with our October projection. Nevertheless, we expect growth to exceed potential through most of 2016 and 2017 so the gap should be substantially closed by late 2017. When considering our policy options, Governing Council needed to bear in mind that our base case forecast omits a key consideration, 
namely the government's intention to introduce fiscal measures to stimulate the economy. Our convention is not to guess about these things, but to incorporate actual announcements. Suffice it to say that were we to incorporate a degree of new fiscal stimulus in this projection today, the output gap would close sooner than in our base case. But how much sooner would depend on the scale and the nature of the fiscal measures. Now it's fair to say, therefore, that our deliberations began with a bias toward further monetary easing. The likelihood of new fiscal stimulus was an important consideration. Others included, first, the Canadian dollar has declined significantly since October, which means that the non-resource sectors of our economy are receiving considerably more stimulus than we projected then. Now let's remember that it typically takes up to two years for the full effect of a lower dollar to be felt. Second, past exchange rate depreciation is already adding around one percentage point to our inflation rate. This is a temporary effect, and it's currently being offset by lower fuel prices, which is another temporary effect. However, we must be mindful of the risk that a further rapid depreciation could push overall inflation higher relatively quickly. Even if this is temporary, it might influence inflation expectations. Le Conseil de direction estime encore que la tendance sous-jacente de l'inflation est légèrement inférieure à 2 étant donné la marge persistante de capacité excédentaire au sein de l'économie qui s'est accrue récemment. Les attentes d'inflation demeurent bien ancrées à environ 2 Comme la croissance de l'économie devrait redépasser celle de la production potentielle à court terme, nous prévoyons que l'inflation va converger vers 2 à mesure que l'écart de production va se résorber et que les effets temporaires des bas prix du pétrole et de la dépréciation passée du taux de change vont se dissiper. To summarize, the drop in oil and other commodity prices constitutes a significant setback for the Canadian economy and has set in motion a protracted adjustment process. That will mean the continuation of a two-track economy, with the resource sector shrinking and other sectors picking up speed, all facilitated by a lower Canadian dollar and supported by very stimulative monetary policy. While that adjustment process sounds mechanical, in fact, it's personal. It's disrupting the lives of many Canadians, whether through job losses or through higher prices for imported goods. Monetary and fiscal policies can help to buffer some of those effects and help to speed up the process by fostering growth in other sectors of the economy. But the adjustment must ultimately take place. Although the economy may grow more slowly than we would like during that transition, it can still achieve above potential growth and absorb its excess capacity. And we are encouraged by the resilience and flexibility of the Canadian economy as signs of adjustment are already evident. Meanwhile, the world economy is expected to strengthen on the back of stimulative policies and low energy costs. And the U.S. economy is on a solid track. And our past monetary actions continue to produce results. These are all positives that should be recognized. And in this context, as complex and uncertain as our situation is, Governing Council decided that the current stance of monetary policy remains appropriate. Permettez-moi de conclure en disant publiquement au revoir à notre cher ami et collègue, le sous-gouverneur Agathe Côté. Elle a assumé ses fonctions à la banque avec distinction pendant plus de 32 ans. Sa date officielle de départ est le 31 janvier. Elle nous manquera à tous au sein du conseil de direction et nous lui offrons nos meilleurs voeux. And with that, I'll now be happy to take your questions. Raymond Fillion, TVA. Bonjour, Monsieur Paulos. Je peux vous entendre en français sur, en quelques mots, les raisons qui font en sorte que vous êtes optimiste quant à l'économie canadienne, les perspectives pour cette année et l'an prochain. C'est vraiment une question des, des facteurs fondamentaux. Premièrement, c'est l'économie américaine qui est 
très solide, avec une faiblesse temporaire dans le quatrième trimestre. Ça recommence euh, presque immédiatement et ça va toucher nos exportations naturellement. Uh, deuxième chose, c'est qu'il y a beaucoup de stimulus dans le, dans, en train à influencer l'économie. Uh, ça prend presque deux ans pour les changements de, de, de taux d'intérêt et le taux de change d'influencer l'output. Ça va prendre un, un an en plus parce que c'est un an depuis uh, notre, uh, nos changements de, de taux d'intérêt. Alors, uh, il faut uh, prendre du patience en, en, visant cette, uh, en voyant cette, uh, ce processus. En dessous de ça, il y a un processus très complexe. Ce, ce, ce processus va continuer pendant trois, peut-être cinq ans. Et durant cette période, c'est possible d'avoir un taux de croissance plus élevé que le taux de, de croissance de potentiel. Et on parle beaucoup du dollar canadien. Jusqu'où ça va aller, selon vous, la chute du dollar? Pardon? de la faiblesse du dollar canadien, le dollar canadien qui baisse sans cesse un peu tous les jours. Ouais. Jusqu'où ça va aller, selon vous? Est-ce que vous avez fait des prévisions à ce niveau-là? Euh, on ne fait pas de prévisions pour ça. Ben, C'est évident que, que le, le dollar canadien est très bien influencé par le, le prix du pétrole. La corrélation est presque parfaite. En fait. Dans un terme d'économiste, c'est un modèle très, très fort. Alors, euh, euh, c'est une espèce de, de uh, shock absorber, je m'excuse, uh, mais uh, c'est un uh, processus où le dollar canadien ne, uh, uh, protège uh, l'économie en partie de ce, ce choc. Et uh, en même temps, ça encourage l'ajustement au choc. Ça va prendre du temps, mais c'est très important de le laisser... Uh, faire cette ce tâche. Mais euh, il n'y a pas de, de niveau particulier dans ce temps-là. Ça dépend entièrement du contexte. Greg Bonnell, BNA. Yes, Governor, I want to ask you a little bit more about the, the rationale. You said that you went into the discussion of the bias towards further easing, so a cut, but you had to consider not only the liberal stimulus plans, but the dollar, and you go into detail with the dollar. So it seems that you did hear sort of the chorus of Bay Street voices saying, Consumer confidence is being eroded that the dollar is plunging too rapidly. So what's your question? If the, did you did you take that into oh. consideration and say consumer confidence in this country is getting a kick because the dollar is dropping too fast and we you have to help stem that? Well, I'd, I'd like to think that we take everything into account. And it's not about opinions, but about the actual economics of what's going on. So we know that the Canadian economy is absorbing a pretty substantial reduction in national income because of the lower price of oil. Um, that's, that effect initially is felt primarily in the energy exporting sector by the companies and their employees. But in the, the next phase, those employees who uh, are laid off spend less money and that begins to affect everyone. And meanwhile, the Canadian dollar acts as a shock absorber as I was just describing. That too, what that does is it raises the price of imported goods And that's the form for many of us that this, this adjustment will take. It means that we have less spending power today than we had before because oil prices are lower. Even though you and I aren't oil exporters, we feel that same effect uh, because the price of imported goods goes up. That's the form, the primary form in which uh, the, the, that loss of income gets spread around the entire economy. And so we have to take that into account. But what I was referring to in the opening statement is to think about when it happens very quickly. We know it, of course, passes through into imported prices, and that affects how we measure inflation. But when it's a gradual process, we give you estimates just a little bit here and a little bit there. Um, but what can happen is if it moves quickly, then there's, there's, there's a fairly rapid incorporation of those changes into actual consumer prices. People see it all at once. And when that happens, then it's possible that that process could begin to influence their expectations of inflation. Now, we don't think that's happening. We believe expectations of inflation are very well anchored on 2% after 25 years of successful inflation targeting. But that is a consideration that we need to bear in mind when the exchange rate is moving quickly. Will it further uh, color your deliberations if the dollar, the dollar got a brief jump off your decision, now it's down with oil again? 
We still have to keep looking at the value of our currency and worrying that it's going too low and you have to act at some point to support it? Well, as I said in response to the previous question, it depends totally on the context that we find ourselves. And if the context continues to shift, then uh, currencies reflect all those things, not any one thing, but all the things that are moving. So we have no control over the things that are driving it. Um, when, when concerns would get, uh, the, where the risks that, we sh uh, that I just spoke about would become more tangible, would be if the dollar was moving rapidly all by itself. So obviously, uh, if, the, if the oil price is going down some more, that's another negative for the Canadian economy. And so the dollar is doing part of the adjusting for us. Bill Curry, Globe and Mail. Um, Governor, you mentioned you're going to wait, obviously, till the budget before count, uh, putting uh, any action on the fiscal side into your projections. Yes. I want to get your thoughts on essentially the debate around uh, <coughs> modeling of these uh, of stimulus, uh, because there's quite a lot of debate going on. Back in 2009, finance had said that for every dollar of uh, stimulus on infrastructure, you get a multiplier effect of about 1.5. Uh, a lot of people say today, in the current context, for a lot of factors, uh, it's actually going to be closer to zero. So what are your thoughts on how effective stimulus spending actually is in terms of generating growth? Well, I'm not going to get into a debate about what those multipliers uh, might be. Um, a, and when we, we do get uh, some things to work with, we'll be working closely with our colleagues at Finance to make sure that we're modeling them in a consistent manner. Because uh, they, after all, are the experts on that. They have the, the best models that, to look at these things. Um, I'm aware of the range of debate on those things. Uh, it's, uh, it's interesting, but uh, what you need to bear in mind is that any economist's analysis of a fiscal shock, or any shock for that matter, it depends on what else is moving at the same time. Okay? If it's the only thing that's moving, then most people can agree. It's what else is moving at the same time. And so uh, there's a lot to take into account. That's why you can't just <clears throat> assume an answer. And I won't uh, today. Um, anyway, uh, well, I think, I, I think I'll just leave it at that because we just don't know what the, what the package might, might contain. So based on that, when you talk about lowering your growth forecast for 2016 to 1.4%, how should we treat that? Should we treat that with an asterisk and wait to the budget and it will likely be a little higher than that? Yes, you should treat it as an asterisk, as I said in my opening remarks, uh, that if, uh, if there's a tangible uh, change to fiscal stance, uh, the way we would offer a summary measure of how that might affect things is it would make that end point where the economy has used up its, its excess capacity, that should make it a bit sooner. And how much sooner depends on the size of the shock and what form it takes, which gets to your first question, the various forms of fiscal spending give different multipliers of a wide range of possibilities. And if you want a concrete example, you can look at last year when the, when the uh, child care benefit package went into place on July 1st, uh, people didn't spend all of that money. But you might have gone into that thinking they would have. And so you'd have a certain multiplier in mind. And uh, so, you know, we don't know how much of it they spent, but we can tell that uh, some people save some of the money and maybe they're saving it for when they do want to spend it. But they certainly didn't spend it the day they got, they got those checks. And so you can't just assume everything. Everything, other things move at the same time. Kendall Palmers, Roger, Mr. Fellows, uh, you've spoken in your opening statement about the <coughs> effect that uh, the dollar's fall has on inflation through a pass-through. But to what extent um, did the, the dollar's fall in a possible uh, further rapid fall way on your decision in respect to anything else. In other words, is there a point at which uh, a weak currency is no longer helpful? Well, as I said before, Randall, it, it depends entirely on the context, so it's incredibly hypothetical uh, question. The context that we have right now is with falling oil prices, and we've had the decline in the dollar as part of that process, which has always been historically the case is the opposite to what happened to us from 2002 to 2012-13. Um, and so we shouldn't be, be surprised by any of it. When the dollar went from, you know, around, actually a little below 70 cents, all the way up to above parity, okay, we, we were watching exactly the same process, but in reverse. And in that process, the higher oil prices would be stimulating the economy. And, and, and also encouraging the sort of adjustment we talk about, which is, moving 
to the growth leadership of the economy away from the rest of the economy and into the energy economy. And so there it, it did its work and it buffered some of those effects. And what it did was by going up, it gave everybody in Canada more income because uh, the cost of imports went down. So now we're seeing exactly the reverse. And so there's no uh, magic number in that story uh, because so many things are moving. So I won't, I won't simply can't get pinned to one. Come back to the question of whether it can be unhelpful. Mr. Dodge used that term in one, at one stage, and the current level uh, was unhelpful, he said back you know, about 13 years ago. But on the other hand, is there a, how would you answer those who say that you, you're putting those concerns, concerns about the dollar, over the very real concerns that people have about their jobs and the uh, oil price shock spreading beyond you know, the oil patch? Well, for, for me, the, the, the key issue would be whether the, uh, the natural process of adjustment that we've identified was in some, for some reason causing people to have doubts about what their inflation expectations should be. Their inflation expectations should be 2%. And right now, that's exactly what we see, and it's been extremely well anchored. Even all through the, uh, the global financial crisis and the aftermath, can Canadians' inflation expectations remain extremely well anchored. And that's a, that's, that's a very... Uh, positive thing for the policymaker to be able to rely upon. It's very important. And so uh, that's the sort of thing that needs to be well defended. So if you have a rapid move in things and for some reason you start to be concerned that the risk that those expectations were becoming less well anchored, then you might need to take an action uh, which stopped that out and proved that uh, those expectations should remain well anchored. Um, and so you can, you can see in other countries who are even, you know, more susceptible to this than we are, such as the Chile's or Colombia's, uh, where they've had to raise interest rates in this context, and that's precisely to take care of that very important issue for the central bank. And uh, so, fortunately, we are not in that situation. But as I said, we name it as a risk in our thing. It's something that we will continue to watch carefully. And one of the key ingredients to that is a rapid um, movement in the currency uh, and in a context which makes it seem less appropriate. We have less than 10 minutes uh, left and many, many, many questions on the list, so I'm, I'm sorry, we might not be able to make them all. Normand Raymond, uh, Raymond pardon, TVA. Mr. Paulos, your report on the political monetary policy talks about the long and complex adjustment that the Canadian economy is facing. It's been for months, if not several months, that the Bank of Canada has exposed this situation. What I want to know is: Do you believe that in this context, it would be judicious that there would be a better synchronization between the fiscal policy of the federal government and the monetary policy of the Bank of Canada? Mm -hmm. Mais, c est, c est de la situation est très complexe et comme j'ai mentionné dans ma présentation il y a deux semaines, il n'y a pas une solution exacte de politique monétaire ou fiscale pour changer ça. L'ajustement doit continuer. Il n'y a pas de choix. Euh, mais le, 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 le vrai rôle pour la politique, c'est de d'offrir quelques, euh, quelques euh, politiques pour, pour réduire les conséquences. Mais en même temps, garder en, en tête la, la nécessité d'avoir cet ajustement. On, on veut, veut voir l'ajustement continuer et pas le prévenir. Alors, euh, un, euh, dans cette situation, si on, si on commence avec l'économie en équilibrium, là, C'est une question encore plus complexe, mais ça, dans cette situation, c'est très clair, clair que l'économie a, a, a de capacité en excès. Alors, c'est évident que les deux politiques opèrent essentiellement dans le, la même direction. En sous-question, vous avez parlé du départ éminent de la sous-gouverneure Agathe Côté. Je sais que le processus pour son remplacement est déjà en marche. Est-ce que vous, vous croyez que la personne qui va remplacer Mme Côté sera une francophone? En ce moment, je n'ai aucune idée. Uh, le processus a commencé. C'est un processus uh, uh, de, de notre conseil d'administration, des membres privés. 
euh, qui, qui euh, font ce processus. Et euh, ça va prendre du temps, mais euh, je n'ai pas de commentaires sur ça en ce moment. David Aiken, Sun Media. Uh, earlier today, uh, the Prime Minister was speaking at Davos at the World Economic Forum, and uh, one of the questions he got asked by the moderator was if he worried about a global recession. Broadly paraphrasing his answer was he's optimistic about uh, future economic conditions. But I'd like to put the same question to you. Uh, you seem a little optimistic if I read between the lines of the NPR, but do you worry about a global recession? Uh, no, we've put our best efforts into uh, the numbers we're offering you today. And, uh, of course, as usual, there are risks around those projections, so we're not trying to uh, say there aren't. And for sure, the level of uncertainty is greater at this moment than it was at any time I can think of in the last couple of years, at least, uh, because of so many things moving at the same time and affecting many countries in different ways. Um, I would note that uh, uh, just yesterday, I think it was, or the, or, yeah, or the day before, the IMF put out its latest outlook for the world. That's a very high quality forecast, one that we can all uh, learn from. And I would say that uh, they have downgraded their outlook for the world. Uh, but in fact, uh, their outlook for the world for 2016 is even still slightly stronger than ours in this report. It's about the same for 2017. So they're in the same ballpark. I'm not going to quibble over decimal points, but I'm not offering you a, a more optimistic forecast than what is a very high quality consensus view. In your remarks to us, you talked about how these adjustments are personal. Um, I thought this was a really interesting insight, and I want to just follow up on that. The inflation expectations of a household, you don't think they're raising, but we're getting an energy bonus. Drivers are seeing cheaper pump prices, but everybody needs to eat, and we're seeing higher food prices, largely on imported food and produce. Uh, is the bonus I'm getting from my energy savings outweighing the increased cost many households are paying for food. In other words, on balance, are people paying more for stuff they normally need? It is for the average household, but I sympathize very much with those who, for whom, you know, food is a bigger share of their of their total spending than the average, uh, because some of those prices have moved very quickly. Um, in part, this is uh, happening because it's of the time of year. We import more of our food at this time of year than we do in the rest of the year. So prices are higher to begin with, and then you know we had the California drought, and and now we have lots of California rain. So we kind of have other things that are affecting those base prices, but we know now there's an extra percentage happening because of the low dollar. And so um, unfortunately, that's a, that's one of these uh, consequences I talked about earlier of that adjustment process is how that income effect of the lost income from higher oil, lower oil prices gets spread around to all of us. But if you look at it from the average household point of view, yes, inflation is running at 1.4 percent, and that's to say that the, the effect from lower energy costs is bigger so far than the effect on uh, the pass-through on other imported goods. Um, and so um, in the end, of course, those two things kind of go hand in hand because the lower oil prices are causing the lower dollar, and so you get it as, as a package. And that's why our inflation rate is down near the lower, uh, lower bound of our of our target. Uh, core inflation is very close to two percent, excluding the food and energy. So that's at this moment not, I think, a better guide to where things actually are. Raphael Bouvier, au clair, Radio Canada. Ben, uh, essentiellement, là, uh, notre analyse suggère que le, le gap de le, 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 le gap dans l'économie uh, va prendre uh, un, un, probablement jusqu'à la fin, la fin de 2017, peut-être uh, plus long que ça, uh, 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 à finir. Et dans ce contexte-là, uh, c'est évident que, que c'est plus, plus tard que dans notre prévision d'octobre. Mais en même temps, nous n'avons pas incorporé uh, le, le, une assumption révisée à la hausse pour le, la, les actions du gouvernement. Ce sera annoncé en printemps, je ne sais pas exactement quand, mais ça va, c'est évident que ça va toucher la prévision dans un sens uh, prévisible. Ça, ça c'est uh, à la hausse. C'est un risque à la hausse qui est très important 
Et nous avons incorporé cela dans notre discussion et on, nous avons décidé que pour le moment, on peut être patient et voir les effets de notre, nos, nos changements de l'année passée euh, euh, continuer à influencer le, le taux de croissance. Justement, sur ce que va présenter le gouvernement, quel effet ça pourrait avoir sur ce que vous venez de nous présenter aujourd'hui, le plan du gouvernement, les investissements prévus par le gouvernement? Ah, je m'excuse, je ne comprends pas. Ce que veut présenter le gouvernement dans le prochain budget, comment ça pourrait influencer les, les chiffres que vous nous présentez aujourd'hui? Je n'ai pas de chiffres pour vous, juste que la direction est claire. Le gouvernement a dit qu'ils vont, vont faire quelque chose. Et, et c'est dans la direction de, de croissance pour l'économie canadienne plus forte. Et ça, ça va réduire le temps qu'il va prendre pour l'économie d'être en équilibre encore. Alors, c'est un, un, un risque à la hausse qui est très important pour la décision de la politique monétaire. Mais pour le moment, on ne peut pas le quantifier. Should I continue? Or? Let's, let's do one more. Kim McRail, Wall Street Journal. Hi, Governor Paulus, thank you for taking questions. Um, I just wanted to ask you about the, uh, the focus on further cuts to capital spending in the oil and gas sector uh, in the NPR. Uh, I think you said that, uh, or the NPR says that um, there's a downgrading of expectations for, for how much would be cut this coming year. And I'd just like to ask you if you could think about this time last year when you were looking at the oil, the, the impact of oil prices as a front-loaded sort of scenario. How much worse is it for the oil and gas sector from, based on what you can see right now? Well, in the sense you described, which is the investment decision, it's really not much worse because a lot of those decisions were taken and uh, and uh, so whether the price is as it is today or ten dollars more those decisions have been taken and i don't think that what, what it changes is the income effect for the country as a whole but not probably the investment decision so we we think there's a there's a sense of non-linearity in there um and so as the uh you recall the last year we asked companies, how much are you going to cut? And they told us. And that proved to be very close to the mark. So about 40% is what they told us. And it's been 38% in 2015. Looking ahead to this year, last year they said it would be around 20%. And that's what we had in our October forecast. And now they're telling us around 25% further cut. So it's very close to what we had. And uh, so what we're talking about as a risk in the forecast is as prices go down gradually, if for every company is different. So at a certain point, it becomes uneconomic, and they, change, they decide they're going to close that capacity or consolidate with another firm or whatever they do. Uh, we don't know where that is, but it's where, it's where you can have other nonlinearities where then there's more disruption in the marketplace. But so far right now, it seems like most people are kind of hunkering down and managing it. And... Uh, so we continue to watch it very closely. The, the NPR deals with the question of whether some firms are reaching a threshold yeah. for, for shutting down. Is that a greater concern now than it was in the past? Well, the lower the price goes, the more you concern yourself with well, what is that threshold. There isn't a, a threshold, I don't think, for the industry. It's, it varies from project to project very, very widely, actually. And uh, <clears throat> so I know, I know that um, some of our oil is, is quite inexpensive to produce. So. That presumably be a very, very low threshold. But some of our other oil is much more expensive to produce. So there's a big range of actions there. Okay. I think we should stop. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody.